So everyone, this is Dr. Troy Wood. Uh, he's an associate professor of chemistry here at the University of Buffalo, which is where I'm attending for my PhD. He's also the director of undergraduate studies, correct? Yes. Very exciting. Um, so Dr. Wood did his PhD at Ohio State with Alan Marshall, and then his postdoc at Cornell with Fred McLafferty. Um, believe it or not, Dr. Wood has authored, I'm going to approximate 100 research articles. Pretty right? close. Yep. Pretty close. Right. I, I looked and it's like, give or take one or two. Um, but in addition to that, two patents and the textbook, um, I actually connected with him on Twitter and you should definitely give him a follow. A shout out to social media. It's at prof, uh, prof, I have, sorry, I can't read prof Troy D Wood. So follow him on Twitter. Anyways, the talk is going to be given today is From Nanoscale to Macromolecules, A Scientist's Odyssey Through Ithaca to the Niagara Frontier. And I believe I'll have to make him a host. Okay, there you go. Okay, and so now I should be able to share. All right, I think this is going to work. All right, sweet. And you guys can see it? Yep. All right, we'll go into presentation mode. So thank you guys for the invitation. It's really great to, to see you all um, cooperating together. And I got to tell you all just at the start that I have a lot of optimism for the future because of your generation. And it's not just because my children are in your generation. It's because I've seen what you guys are doing. And I think that you guys are going to be able to improve the world from the mess that we left you in. So I hope to enjoy my retirement watching your achievements. Uh, I do plan to live for a long time. My grandmother's in her 90s and she had COVID and she didn't get sick. So I'm hoping that I inherited some of her resilience and I'll get to see what you guys do in your careers. Okay. So, uh, this talk is really going to be about sort of my uh, pathway to science and um, afterward, you know, we can certainly answer some questions about what it was like in that pathway, but I wanted to give you a, a, a flavor of what that was. So, from the time I was a kid, I was always really interested in science and engineering. Part of it was that I shared my birthday with Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison, as you know, invented the light bulb and the phonograph and, and many things. And so he was sort of an inspiration for me. But I also was fascinated with just how in the heck does the universe work? And I'd look at things and be, I'd be just like, it's so complex. I don't know anything. I want to know more. Um, but I was also interested in um, the process of disease. Uh, I had neighbors growing up next door who had cystic fibrosis and I watched three of them die from cystic fibrosis. And so I had a, a very early interest in, you know, the etiology of disease and, and even so, what was the root cause of that? Now, my brother and I were also huge Star Trek geeks. We loved uh, to watch Star Trek. And so, yes, I have seen every episode of every Star Trek, except for um, today's episode of the cartoon, Lower Decks. But I'll catch that by tomorrow. <laughs> so have that. And then my dad was an electrician and always, you know, was working with electricity and devices. So I, that was always fascinating. But I think a big thing that really pushed me into science was that I had a lot of teachers in K through 12 who were really encouraging in, in that way. In fact, my, my second grade science or second grade teacher uh, just passed away about a month ago. And he was a really big influence in, in me going into science because we watched practically every film in his class that NASA had produced on exploration of the planets at that time. So early on, I was thinking maybe I'm going to be an astronaut. So when I finally decided, you know, to go to college, I had some, some choices. Um, one of the things I thought about was medicine, but I really didn't like biospecimens. 
And the irony is today I work with biospecimens all the time. So I didn't get into medicine because of biospecimens and that's what I work with. So the question was really, um, was I gonna go into chemistry or chemical engineering? And I decided to go into chemistry. And I went to Indiana University, which in the middle 1980s had one of the strongest analytical chemistry programs in the United States. And I was a member of the honors program. They now have a college just like they do here at UB for honors. And I was able to do undergraduate research with a professor by the name of Ken Bush. And Ken um, was a young assistant professor at the time. And the work that I did there was mass spectrometry um, by separating things on TLC plates. So something that you know we learned in organic chemistry lab. And then I was using a different way to try to characterize things. And that really got me on the route of research. But while I was at Indiana, my plan for being an astronaut really changed. Um, I was literally doing general chemistry homework when I heard on the radio that the space shuttle Challenger had had an accident. And when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna be an astronaut. Um, it's too risky and I am sufficiently risk averse that I can't do that. So I was thinking, I'm gonna go into the chemical industry after I graduate. But because I had sort of caught this research bug, both Professor Bush and some of the other analytical faculty really said, you know, maybe what you want to do is before you go into industry, go to graduate school. So they really sort of encouraged me to go into a doctoral program. And so I got my BS in 1989. So that tells you my approximate age. And I went to graduate school. And I went to Ohio State University. Um, and there were lots of choices, but um, at Ohio State was this person who I could sort of recognize was rising up the ranks quickly. And he was a dreamer like me. Um, you know, one of the things that really got me to join his group, even though I didn't do research on this particular project, was that he had this dream of trying to determine the mass of the neutrino by measuring mass differences of isotopes of hydrogen three and helium three very, very accurately. And I'm like, this guy is a dreamer. And so I was really excited to get the chance to work for him. And it turns out that he had invented a type of mass spectrometry that I still use today, all of this time later, called the Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. And this instrument is based upon the fact that charged particles in a magnetic field spin. They have what we call cyclotron motion. And as you can see here, uh, the famous cyclotron equation says that the frequency of that spin, omega, is equal to the charge of a particle Q times the magnetic field strength that the particle is in divided by its mass. And so this means that a species' frequency is completely independent of its velocity. It just depends on the magnetic field and the charge to mass ratio. Now what Alan did to make FTICR work was one, he wanted to be able to detect the ions for a long time. This is the nature of all Fourier techniques like FTIR and FTNMR. And for an ion in a magnetic field, the ion gets a balance between the Lorentz force that pulls it toward the magnetic field axis and the fact that it is spinning in a motion that's a centripetal motion. And so that perfect balance gives it an orbit or a circular path. So can you detect the motion of that cyclotron motion of a charged particle? And the answer was yes, Alan and, and uh, his collaborator, Mel Commissaro, figured out a way to do that. 
And when they did, the thing that they didn't anticipate was that this new technique that they had developed would be able to give you very, very high mass resolution or resolving power. This is just an example uh, from my group that uses an FTICR to show this. So let's see if I, you can see my arrow anyway. Um, this is just a 10 mass to charge window of a spectrum of a triptych digestion of an enzyme known as glucokinase. And the resolution is so high that in this 10 Dalton window, I can detect four different unique species. So you see here with the orange circles, this is a species which has a plus two charge on it. And I know that it's plus two because if you look past this decimal, these masses are separated by 0.5 of an atomic mass unit. So it's a doubly charged ion. And these squares, the green and the red, there's two different species, but they both happen to be triply charged because each of the peaks are separated by 0.333 atomic mass units. So triply charged. And then the triangles are quadruply charged. Um, everything is separated by 0.25 of an M over Z. And you might ask, uh, why are there multiple peaks for the same species? And that's because in nature, nature has provided um, different elements with isotopes. Now, not every element has multiple isotopes, but when it comes to biological and organic molecules, carbon does have a naturally occurring isotope carbon 13. So for every carbon that you have, there is a 1.1% chance that it's carbon 13 and not carbon 12. So when you get to large molecules and glucokinase is a large molecule, it's 32,000 molecular weight, even triptych digests, which are about, mm, you know, anywhere from one to three kilodalton, has lots of carbon atoms. And so with this doubly charged peak with the orange dots, you can see that the all carbon 12 containing peak is actually lower in abundance than the one that contains a single carbon 13. It's because there are approximately, not quite, but almost 100 carbon atoms in this particular triptych digest. So high resolution. And that meant we could start dealing with mixtures that were very, very complex. So one of the things that I worked on as a graduate student was I really was involved in nanoscience and in the very early days of the buckyball craze. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was awarded for the discovery of, of buckyballs or fullerenes to Richard Smalley and his collaborators. And they actually discovered buckyballs using mass spectrometry. So I was one of the early people in the world that had macroscopic quantities of buckyballs and um, including buckyballs that were filled with lanthanum. So that was a lot of what I did as a graduate student. And I used the FTICR coupled with a laser to ionize my buckyball materials. Another thing I did, but nobody really uses it anymore because our, our FTICR got better, is we tried to improve our res resolution by squeezing the ions onto the magnetic field axis. We called that axialization. And for about five years, that was really hot. Now nobody uses it, <laughs> but for five years, it was really hot. And I got my PhD in 1993. And while I was a graduate student, uh, Alan and I talked about, well, what, what did I want to do? And I had sort of decided by that point that I really was interested in academic life. And he goes, well, if you're going to go to an academic life, it would be good to go to a place that has a reputation for generating 
lots of um, academic members. And so one of the things that he suggested was his friend, Fred McClafferty. And Fred McClafferty, uh, by the way, Fred McClafferty, th th even though th this picture shows him uh, in his 80s, Fred is now 97, still alive and well, a uh, member of the National Academy. And Fred graciously took me into his group as a postdoc. And Fred was very famous because I knew of Fred from the time I was a sophomore taking organic chemistry because there was a famous rearrangement reaction in the gas phase called the McClafferty rearrangement. Well, Fred had discovered that. And by the way, he's a very humble guy. He would never call it the McClafferty rearrangement. To us, he always used his proper organic nomenclature and called it the gamma hydrogen rearrangement. So I was able to work with Fred. And while I was there, Fred was pione pioneering doing high resolution on the FTICR with a fairly new ionization method called electrospray ionization. And we still use electrospray ionization today. Electrospray takes a sample that is in a liquid and by using a pump, delivers it to a needle that is in an electric field. And this produces the electro spray. You get a spray, just like you would see a spray at the end of a hose that you might use for water. This is in an electric field, and so you get droplets. And this is done at atmospheric pressure. So what happens as these droplets get accelerated in an electric field toward the inlet of a mass spectrometer is the droplets shrink. And eventually, um, they lose mass, the solvent that they're in, but they don't lose their charge. So eventually, you get to a point where these droplets have a lot of charge on them and not much solvent left, and they explode. We call that Coulombic explosion. And eventually, you form in the ambient conditions these ions that have multiple charge on them. And why that's important is because that opens up the realm of biochemistry to mass spectrometrists. And I happened to get to Cornell literally a few months after Fred's group had developed this instrument an FTICR that had an electrospray source coupled to it. It was actually the second of its kind in the world. The first one was in Fred's lab and it had a three Tesla magnet, but this one had a six Tesla magnet. And so with that, we had this new uh, mousetrap, as you might say, to do research with. So it turns out I happened to be in the right place at the right time. We didn't even have a name for it at that time, but what it, people now call top-down proteomics, we were developing at Cornell. And I was one of the first people in the world to actually do an experiment. Um, we were working with a group from UC San Francisco on the enzyme creatine kinase. And they had a whole bunch of questions that they wanted to answer about creatine kinase. And so Fred and George Kenyon decided, let's collaborate together. And Troy is gonna be doing the mass spec of the creatine kinase enzyme. And during my time at Cornell, I set what was the world record for isotopic resolution for the largest mass, the creatine kinase dimer at 86 kilodaltons. That record has been blown away since then, but I had a world record for a few years. But perhaps the thing that really helped me to get an academic job was not just the creatine kinase work, but the fact that Fred, uh, like Alan and like me, were dreamers. And someone in our field made a statement in a paper that really annoyed Fred. And that statement was, 
that it doesn't seem that in the absence of water that a protein can have higher order structure, that water is essential. That was the paradigm. And Fred goes, you know, people shouldn't say things when they don't have evidence to support that. And Fred actually had the idea that proteins might have some higher order structure in the gaseous state. So he's like, Troy, prove it. And so we used cytochrome C, a protein whose solution phase and crystalline conformation is really well understood and showed by doing hydrogen deuterium exchange experiments that we could fold and unfold cytochrome C in the gaseous state by how it reacted by exchanging uh, hydrogen for deuterium that we introduced through D2O. Um, this paper was in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It is still for a little bit of time, my most cited paper, uh, but that's going to get passed by a paper that Fred and I had after I was a, an assistant professor here at UB that's going to surpass it because in that paper we could actually talk about the conformation in distinct segments of the cytochrome C, but I, I attribute this paper to helping me really get a job. So I learned some good things from Cornell and from Fred. First of all, is that if you have better mouse traps or better instrumentation, you can solve bigger questions, but do better science. And Fred really emphasized to me to look at all of the information in a piece of data that you collected, not to consider any piece of information inconsequential. And honestly, Fred was the one who realized that I was detecting the creatine kinase dimer in all of our creatine kinase spectra and that we were getting isotopic resolving power, I didn't recognize that at first. So I learned that from Fred. But the other thing that I learned from Fred, I sort of have talked about, is that you, people shouldn't say things in the literature that cannot be backed up without evidence, at least modeling. And it was a paradigm that water was essential for higher order structure of biomolecules. But we showed that biomolecules can have higher order structure in the complete absence of water. And now dozens of research groups have shown that we were right. And so sometimes taking a risk and going against conventional wisdom can really lead to some good results. So that helped me to get this job at UB and UB University of Buffalo is in a region of New York that is sometimes called the Niagara Frontier. So I completed my postdoc and came straight to UB. And um, I can tell you that as an assistant professor, everything is not glorious for sure. But I found out something about myself that I didn't know before, and that was in the mission of a professor, teaching is important as well as research. And what I found out that I actually enjoyed teaching and mentoring. And so that became a, a big part of who I was. It wasn't who I was at the beginning of the journey as an assistant professor, but it became who I, I, I did become. And so this is um, my first set of students in my research group who've gone on to bigger and better things back in 1996. And one of the things that we established back then was uh, a um, group outing to Niagara Falls to Goat Island where there was a statue of Nikola Tesla. And I told you earlier that I was an Edison fan growing up, but I've learned a lot about Nikola Tesla in the 25 years since I've been at UB. And now I have to say, I'm on Team Tesla. And just to show you how serious I am about that, this is my Tesla bobblehead, okay? Tesla is with me at my desk every day.
Okay, so in that time when I started as an assistant professor, a big thing going on in the field of mass spectrometry was this miniaturized version of electrospray called nanoelectrospray. And instead of using hypodermic needles to shoot the sample out, instead they took a needle that was fabricated usually from glass or fused silica. So it had a much smaller uh, inner diameter and that allowed for the flow rates to be used to go down dramatically from microliters per minute to nanoliters per minute. So you got very low detection limits and people were showing hey, you can work with real biochemical samples, samples that have SDS, samples that are in phosphate buffered saline, and you can still spray this thing. And you got two to three orders of magnitude improvement in sensitivity. So we were now set to really expand what we could do and contribute to proteomics. But there was a catch. And in those days, nanospray was a little bit of a um, poker game or craps. It was a gamble because what happened a lot of times when we did nanospray, and we certainly did this at UB, is that the uh, uh, nanospray emitters were coated with gold metal. And in an electric field, let me tell you, gold comes off of glass or silica very easily. You have electrical discharge. It's like you got a lightning bolt. And when that happens, the nanospray emitter is dead. So you might have had a precious sample in that emitter. Well, now you can't use it because the nanospray emitter is no good. So people were trying to figure out how can we make this better? Some people thought about coating it with a protective layer on the top or maybe an underlayer. Uh, some people even controlled the thickness of their gold by doing electrolysis. But in any case, none of these were really ideal and they were all tedious. So we decided to think outside of the box. Can we use something that's not a metal? And so the idea that we came up with was why don't we use a conductive polymer? Because polymers can be molded, they can be shaped. And it turns out that polyaniline is a very conductive polymer. And it behaves as a conductor if it is in the presence of acid, especially strong acid like hydrochloric. And so you protonate the nitrogens in the back backbone. And as you can see, I've got these repeat units Y and X. And Y is, um, if it's one, is what we call the leucal emeraldine base form. And emeraldine is if it's 50-50. But what we found out was that polyaniline adheres to glass extremely well. It likes the silanols of glass. And it's almost impossible to destroy by electrical discharge. I can tell you, we tried. You're probably more likely to break your emitter by handling than you are for it to be destroyed by electricity. So we showed that it worked both with silica and borosilicate, which is, is laboratory glasses that we use. And it always had a longer lifetime than the metals. In fact, most of our emitters would get retired. Um, they could still work, but they'd had a sample and we didn't want to contaminate it, so we just threw it out because now we could make them cheap. And so, as a result of that, one of my mentors here at UB was Dr. Bob Jenko. And in 1999-2000, Bob, who was a DDS as well as a researcher and professor at UB, um, was really encouraging that we should try to commercialize this technology. And so we applied for a patent and we got it. And I formed a company um, with um, 
Bob's encouragement called nanogenesis. And that was our motto and that was our logo, durable emitters for low flow ESI. And so probably pretty heavily for about four to five years, I had a dual life. I had a life here as a professor at UB and I had a life as the vice president and director of research at Nanogenesis. And we had space in the technology incubator, those of you who are here at UB uh, know of the technology incubator on Sweet Home Road. Yeah, I was paying rent there and I had a company. And one of the things that we found was that this uh, polyandolin gave us incredible stability in our mass spectrometry performance. So this was an example that was done by my doctoral student, Tommy White. And you can see this signal is really stable, except for two places. And I love this story because this spike happened when Tom leaned on the mass spectrometer. Then all of a sudden the signal shot up. He took his hand off and it returned to the same place that it was. And it stayed that way until all the solvent was out. And then you got no signal. So these were some of the most stable nanospray emitters that people had ever observed up to this time. And then down here at the bottom is an example of a nanospray mass spectrum that we could get from one of those devices. Now, even though I'm on Team Tesla now, there's still some lessons to be learned from Edison. And one of his uh, great quotes on biomedical advances, I really think is appropriate for us here in the 21st century. And Edison said, he made this prediction that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human body, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So Edison thought that, you know, as science advances, we would know what causes disease and so we could take steps to prevent it and therefore medication would not be necessary. And so as we're learning more and more about causes of different disease states, I think this is a, a particularly interesting uh, observation by Edison. So our group decided, I decided to retire from nanogenesis. The company still exists, but it's just my consulting gig. Uh, once in a while. We don't make nanospray emitters anymore. We make them in my lab, uh, but we don't sell them anymore. But I got really interested in using mass spectrometry as a device to discover biomarkers. Okay? And so biomarkers, these are substances that may be indicative of a health state. And so mass spectrometry plays a key role in this whole thing because identifying and validating biomarkers can be done by mass spectrometry. So in particular, we're interested in using mass spectrometry to get this biomarker identification. We do use it as a tool in biomarker enrichment. I'm not gonna talk about any of that in, in the rest of the talk, but we can use it for that. So, one of the first places that we really began um, was in autism research. And I know uh, Ben knows a little bit about some of the autism research, but uh, not very many people really know the story of how we got into it. So in 2003, I got hired by barristers from the United Kingdom representing children um, who had autism and their parents believed that vaccines might be responsible. Now, I will tell you, I had no opinion on the matter. I was not biased one way or another. I was totally neutral, but I was hired to look for evidence. And I'm gonna tell you that we didn't find any evidence that vaccines cause autism. So I'm gonna tell you that up front. I was involved with a lot of experts all around the world in autism, and we did not find evidence that vaccines cause autism. But in my own research, we found something else that was pretty interesting and led us to a biomarker. So what I'm gonna show you, this was work that was done by Chris Pennington, who's now the director of the mass spectrometry facility at Rice University, which of course Rice 
is where Richard Smalley was and discovered buckyballs. And Chris runs that mass spec facility now. And so we were looking at extracts of urines from different children. And on the top, you see a chromatogram of a urine from a child that we'll call a control, healthy control. And you see this huge peak. And it turns out that peak had a mass of 595. And it was the first peak that eluded in the chromatogram, so we called it 595A. And when we fragmented it, it produced this pattern. Okay, great. But what gets really interesting is if we now look at a similar extract from a child with autism, this peak is massively depleted. And the example that I'm showing here, the peak area is 68 times lower. And in seven urines that we had from autistic children from Scotland, we found that in five of the seven, this peak was at least 10 times lower. In four of the seven, it was at least 100 times lower. And it's the same species. Unfortunately, we had to go by 595A at the time because we didn't know what it was. And so one of the expert consultants on this project in the UK was Neil Castagnoli, one of the world's foremost biological mass spectrometrists. And Neil said, Troy, I haven't seen anything that fragments like this in a mass spectrometer. I don't know what it is. So we had a mystery. But, in 2006, we had a breakthrough because the human metabolome database came online. And Neil and I had an intuition that turned out to be correct. And our intuition was that maybe, maybe, because this substance has such a difficult fragmenting, it's a really stable structure. And so maybe it's involved in the porphyrin uh, metabolism. Human metabolome database came online and said, hey, there is a human metabolite that has a mass pretty close to what we want. And it's called stercobilin. And it's found in fecal matter and urine. And I found out we could buy it. So we bought some, we did nanospray, we did MSMS, and it turns out that 595A is stercobilin. So this was finally confirmed by Yong Choi, who's now a professor at Dankook University in Korea. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that story, but there's a time gap. And I want to say that while we're about this time and we're starting to make some progress on biomarkers, another influential mentor I had here at UB was Dr. Bruce Holm, who was the first director of the Center for Excellence here at UB in biology and the life sciences. And Bruce really liked what we were doing with nanospray. And he said, hey, I want your technology to make a real impact in the life sciences. So he put us in contact with some other researchers in San Francisco, again, UC San Francisco, and Vishu Lingapa. And what we were able to do is show that nanospray was used in validating and discovering that superoxide dismutase 1 is a biomarker for both forms of ALS. And I want to tell you that story a little bit. So what Vishu was able to do is to get from biobanks spinal fluid from people who had died of normal old age, but people who had also suffered from ALS, both what's known as the familial type of ALS and the sporadic type of ALS. In familial, we know that there is a mutation in the sequence of superoxide dismutase, and you end up getting ALS. Sporadic is different though. It has the normal superoxide dismutase, 
there's no changes in the sequence. And yet the individuals still develop ALS. And they also uh, had spinal cord or cerebrospinal fluid from people that had Parkinson's and Huntington's and Alzheimer's. And what I want to show you is that in these gels, all of the familial and sporadic ALS patients had this marker at 32 kilodalton. Now, Bishu suspected it was superoxide dismutase. But he needed us because of our sensitivity with the nanospray to prove that it was. And so this just sort of um, shows the 32 kilodalton peak both on a PVDF membrane and in uh, polyacrylamide gel. And there's a little bit of a shift between it, but this part that came from the polyacrylamide gel, we did trypsin digestion and found out we produce a digest of superoxide dismutase. We identified um, all of the peptides in superoxide dismutase. And actually we tracked this kinetically as well. So we could watch as trypsin digestion occurred over time what were the first tryptic peptides formed and what came subsequently, and it's ALS. So it turns out superoxide dismutase is a common marker to all ALS, even when it is not mutated in some way. It has the normal sequence. So the question still continues to this day. Why do people with normal SOD ever get ALS? Still an unanswered question. We got excited by that proteomics work. And so then we started working with Sarah Gaffin, who used to be here in the dental school at UB, but moved on to the University of Pittsburgh. And it turned out her postdoc and my grad student were married. And so we decided we should collaborate with each other. And Sarah's group was interested in interleukin 17. And it turns out that there is an oligonucleotide binding proton, protein that we call CEBP. And interleukin-17 modulates it. And it turns out interleukin-17 is involved in many major diseases like arthritis, asthma, MS, ovarian cancer, and Hodgkin's. And so Sarah had this hypothesis that exposure of interleukin-17, by interleukin-17 to CEBP beta would initiate phosphorylation. And so she said, you got nanospray, your grad student's married to my postdoc, let's see if they can solve this problem. Well, they did. And so, in, in specifically, I want to talk about this particular peptide. We'll see it in, in the next region. And as you can see here, there are a lot of serine residues and threonine residues. And in protein phosphorylation, serine and threonine residues are heavily involved. Yes, there are phosphorylations at tyrosine. But the vast majority of protein phosphorylations are at serine and threonine residues. And Sarah said, we got a whole bunch of targets here. Do you think we could identify phosphorylation sites on them using your technology? So we developed a protocol. So they exposed cells to interleukin-17 and then did isoelectric focusing and polyacrylamide gel. Uh, to isolate, then excise a band. And of course, in proteomics, once you've got your protein, you do alkylation of it to reduce any disulfides and trypsin digestion. And that's where we came in. We did the, the reduction alkylation, the trypsin digestion, and then enriched the sample. And we used uh, a type of group 4B metal oxide called titania. 
And it turns out Titania has a really high affinity for phosphorylated peptides. So we would enrich our protein samples with this phosphorylated CEPP beta, desalt, and then do nanospray and tandem mass spectrometry. And this is the only paper that I've ever gotten any of the science journals. I've had uh, several in proceedings of the National Academy, but we got this in science signaling. Sarah and I were really excited. So I want you to look at, um, this is an untreated sample of a triptych digest of CEBP beta. And this peak at 1067.3 turns out to be a triptych peptide that contains uh, this sequence of amino acids. But if you expose it to interleukin 17, that peak shifts and it shifts to 120.7. Now this is a triply charged peptide. And it moved um, by 53 Daltons or so. And so it turns out this has to do because of phosphorylation on two amino acid residues, which we proved by doing tandem mass spectrometry or MSMS. And we were able to prove that two of the threonine residues specifically were phosphorylated. And actually, kinetically, we show that it happened in sequence, that one happens before the other. So a lot of people uh, have you know, replicated this result now and are interested in how the phosphorylation might have to do with immune response. Okay. So our most recent sort of biomarker thing is we didn't forget about stirkability. But in, in the intervening years, we tried to get research funding and people said, don't try to do this on human urine samples. You need to prove in an animal model that there's anything up with this hypothesis that stercobilin is actually depleted. So why don't you get some transgenic mice or rats and demonstrate it in one of those models? So we started with a Timothy syndrome model with uh, Russell Rasmussen here at the UB Medical School. And the Timothy syndrome mice exhibit behaviorally autism, okay? This was proven by behavioral researchers at Stanford. And what we did is, you know, you can't collect urine so easily from a mouse, but it's very easy for any of you who've worked with mice or rats, you know, you pick them up, they practically go. And so we decided to start to collect the droppings because stercobilin is actually more abundant in fecal matter than urine. And what we found is that stercobilin isn't just depleted in the Scottish urines that we saw of autistic subjects, but in Timothy syndrome mice. And so we have found that with greater than, uh, or, or I should say not greater than, less than, 0.001 confidence that stercobilin is depleted, about a uh, factor of two in the fecal matter of the autistic mice. And another substance related to it that's in the metabolic cycle called stercobilinogen also appears to be depleted by about the same level, but we don't have as much confidence with that. So our, our p-value for that is only 0.07 at this point. But I can tell you ongoing work, you know, because Emily had to graduate and she went to do a postdoc at Ohio State, but not with my advisor. My advisor's now at Florida State. So she has a different advisor than I had at Ohio State, but she's at my alma mater, making the old man proud. And um, we are currently looking at another autism model in fecal matter. Um, and it turns out that stercobilin depletion happens there as well, but not to the extent that we saw in the Timothy syndrome mice. So we think we know the reason why, and it has to do with cohabitation. So Ben, at some point, I'm going to have to talk to you about your mice or rats 
and maybe getting some fecal matter from you because if we had yet another model that showed this, I think that we would go a long way into going back to where we want to go, which is to go back to humans and see if this is a general biomarker to help us diagnose autism. You name it. Anytime you need some fecal matter, I got six or seven autism models and they poop quite a bit. So, okay. Um, so in the last few years though, I've really got interested in, can we discover, uh, markers of biological relevance in tissues and a technique has been, uh, evolving over the past, oh, 25 years called mass spectrometry imaging. And it's done with a laser like I used to use back in the days when I was a graduate student. So we came up with, I think, a fairly novel way of doing mass spectrometry imaging. This sort of relates back to my buckyball experience in my nanoscience. Is it turns out Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded a few years ago for the discovery of single layer allotrope of carbon called graphene. And it comes from graphite. They literally pulled an atomic layer off by putting double-sided sticky tape on graphite. But it turns out graphene absorbs really well at the frequency that our laser, that we do laser ablation with, uh, emits at. So I said to one of my students at the time, Joe Steet, and then later to, to Will Friesen is, I think this matrix, this could be a great matrix for doing imaging mass spectrometry. And one of the things that we found, my hypothesis being confirmed, was that I'm like, the thing about graphene is it's a single sheet. And everybody's complaining that they can only get so far in spatial resolution in imaging. I think we can do better because graphene isn't a crystal, it's a sheet. And it turns out we can actually get spatial resolution that's now on the order of about a red blood cell size. So toward single cell imaging. Now why that's important, and I'm gonna tell you this, it, I, I just found out yesterday, so I added this slide, uh, that we're getting the cover of an upcoming issue of Journal of the American Society of Mass Spectrometry. And Emily actually did this artwork and um, we didn't have to hire anybody to do it. She did it. And anyhow, it's going to be on the cover of this special issue about imaging mass spectrometry. And the paper has to deal with looking at the process of myelin damage, the demyelination and remyelination process. So this is work that we're doing with Fraser Sim in the medical school at UB. I, I think, Ben, I think you know Fraser. And Frazier has this hypothesis uh, that um, you have oligodendrocytes that bind and help the repair of myelin once demyelination has been induced. And demyelination in Frazier's lab is induced by injecting lysolectin. And then what happens is that remyelination occurs. And so Frazier and I decided, you know what, we could do something with, with this. And Frazier has um, spinal cords in which the mice are damaged by injection of lysolectin. And let's watch the process of demyelination and remyelination happen, not at a cellular scale, but at a molecular scale. And so, uh, here is a control mouse, and you see a distribution of these species, which happen to be lysophosphatidylcholines. And um, the differences in the mass are because of the difference between protonated and sodiated versions of these lipids. But in the control, you see that they're fairly evenly distributed in a spinal cord section. And then this is the histology of that. And you see, that's got a great butterfly, but we can't see our butterfly in the control. 
Interestingly though, if you inject lysolectin, and so the, the, down on the bottom, these are the histology of the lesion sites over the course of days, from three days to 28 days after the lesion. We show that mass spectrometry can actually show the process we've injected. By the way, these are the components of lysolectin, okay? And so three days after injection, they're gone almost everywhere, depleted, except near the injection site. But with time, they start to become restored. And at about 14, in the period 14 to 28 days, it looks very similar to what it was in the beginning. So the remyelination process. So we showed that you could do molecular imaging of the lesion site and not just track what happens on a cellular scale, but at a molecular scale. So Fraser's group and I are still working together on some, some aspects of that. But another way that we can do imaging, and this was just developed in my lab this year, is using a technique called desorption electrospray. So it's like electrospray, except now you shoot blank solvent at an actual tissue, a surface. Okay, so you can have cryotomed um, sections of tissue or even plant leaves, it turns out. And you can start to determine what's at the surface of this tissue. So here, we used desorption electrospray ionization, and, and this is just the, the region of a brain section, and we get this lipid profile. So we're just starting to do um, lipid imaging with DESI, but I'm actually more excited about it for a different reason. And that is, um, we spray solvent on it, right? This solvent can selectively remove lipids. And why I'm interested in that is if you can remove the lipid background or deplete it, now we can start to attack neuropeptides. And so for people who are behaviorists, they're really interested, they don't care about the lipids so much, they're interested in the neuropeptide levels and how do they change as a function of a, say, a, a trigger, a psychological trigger. So we can start to investigate those sorts of questions now. The last thing that I'm gonna talk about is um, something that's been in work for a long time. So 14 years ago, we developed a type of, of nanospray that actually has an immobilized material on the inside of the emitter, trypsin, mobilized on the wall surface. And that means you could inject a protein into the emitter and do digestion. So way back when we showed we could do this for standard proteins, and this happens to be one of the tryptic peptides of cytochrome C, and then you can do uh, tandem mass spectrometry on it and figure out what the peptide is. Now, where this gets exciting, I told you I'm a dreamer. And this might be my biggest dream. Is that there's a group in Mexico City, Abel Moreno. And I met Abel a few years ago. And Abel, two years ago, had extracted what he thinks is protein from fossilized eggshells of the hadrosaur. And he has some crystallographic evidence and he has some polyacrylamide gel and uh, liquid chromatography of this. And so we're working with Abel now to see if that material is truly a protein by using our microreactors. Because Abel can produce for us maybe five to nine microliters of protein extract. It's not a lot of material but more than enough for our microreactors. And uh, the microreactors, we've got that going again and it's working. And so we hope to be applying this to what we think are dromycalcins, which are proteins found in eggshells in modern birds and reptiles. And so we've got our hands on crocodile eggshell 
proteins, as well as chicken, ostrich, and emu. And we're gonna be comparing those, hopefully, to protein extracts from dinosaur fossilized eggs. So I wanna thank all of you um, for the opportunity to speak with you today. And of course, even though I work with a vacuum, I don't work in a vacuum. Teams of people do stuff in science, okay? And so I like to make that joke, while I work with a vacuum, I don't work in a vacuum, you work with others and you collaborate. And doing interdisciplinary research with other people, I cannot advocate it any more strongly because all of the best discoveries that we've made have really been doing it in collaboration with other people and who had different expertise, but where a technique we had developed could actually answer a question that was pressing them. And so I thank you and uh, I would be glad to take any questions that you guys might have. It's impossible to do a round of applause on, on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Dr. Wood, for your presentation. That um, the dinosaur egg thing and comparing them with crocodile and uh, like that is really, really, really cool. That's gonna be very interesting. You know, and it's a risk, right? And so, and here's the thing. I got a grad student who said, I told him from the very beginning, I'm like, this is risky. We may never get a dinosaur protein. But I can tell you that right now in the world, nobody knows the sequence of the crocodile protein. And fortunately, our collaborators can get crocodile shells. So at the very least, we're gonna figure out something about the structure of the crocodile protein that's related to the bird ones. And we're gonna be able to do sequence homology to figure out, hey, how close is the crocodile related to these birds and hopefully dinosaurs? If you get the dinosaur proteins, you should submit that directly to science. Yeah, that's, that's the plan. I would go nowhere else. <laughs> And I, you know, I still haven't gotten one in science itself. Science signaling, yes. And I'm very happy about the science signaling paper, but I would like to get a science paper before I retire. I still have some time. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Um, ben, who is also, uh, well, I'll go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, I know that you started off in chemistry and then now it looks like your work is like really interdisciplinary, dis, dis, interdisciplinary. Sorry about that. Uh, was it hard to learn about all the extra stuff? Like did it take a really long time? Like did it kind of come like naturally? Well, also I'll tell you, you know, um, I actually had zero biochemistry as an undergrad. I never was exposed to it until I was a grad student. My wife had, an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. So she knew more biochemistry than I did. I had to catch up. And so I started taking classes. But then as I started doing research, um, I got more and more interested in it, right? And so I began to read more and more about the field. And mostly the, the thing is, I would say, is by working with other people, I learn from them about their expertise and I build my knowledge base. And it's, it's one of the things in my group that I really emphasize is that, okay, we're gonna train you to use mass spectrometry. And there will be some inherent value in that because you know how to use mass spectrometry. But you're gonna have value added. The value added is that you can think about problems in an interdisciplinary way. And quite frankly, I mean, my students have done pretty well. Most of them make a lot more money than me. So I'm proud of them. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Yeah, that's a great question. I was about to say, um, Ben Areskovich, he's a, uh, undergraduate in chemistry at Canisius. 
you know, left a message in the chat. He said, I, I really enjoyed you hearing about your work. I'd like to be able to ask you more about some of the applications of your nano emitters at some point. Absolutely. Would be glad to. I'll definitely make sure that he gets in touch with you. I um, personally, I am completely serious. I would be happy to provide some, uh, some samples for you. I, I could, we could talk more about how the actual sample collection goes. I don't know if I just pick them up and put them in a bag and, you know, yeah, it turns out, you know, they, when you, when you pick them up, you've got it. If you've got Eppendorf's handy, you can catch him in the Eppendorf's pretty easily. <laughs> so it turns out it's not bad. And I, you know, I had, I, I'll tell you that I had a, a colleague in the field who's like, oh, but it's not so difficult to, to catch mouse or rat urine. I used to do it. And I said, but how many times did you get sprayed with it? He goes, well, okay, that's true. I said, we're trying to avoid that. <laughs> but we want to use the animal model so that we have more evidence to really push this idea that it's worth looking in the human urines. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, fully on board with providing that. I have sort of a question about um, like, so something that I'm going through right now, <clears throat> I'm applying for postdocs right now. And I know that we have members of all the varying levels and ages. I'm kind of curious. I, I feel that I'm applying a lot of energy, making sure that every decision I make is like optimized. Like, you know, want to make sure I go to the right lab with the, all this stuff that's perfect. But I've heard, you know, like for example, my PI, she says that she just, she w was given an offer for a postdoc. She just went and didn't even like think twice. She didn't, you know, she just did it. And uh, I want to know what your opinion is. Like, you know, like retrospectively, do you feel that you could have gone with the flow or you felt that those kind of really structured decisions were very valuable? What's your perspective? You know, I did do structured decisions. I sort of implied that in the, in the talk and Alan and I, oh, maybe nine months before I defended, sat down and we had a really long conversation about future plans. Cause he's like, you're getting close. So we need to start planning and, and what do you want to do? And he knew I wanted an academic career. We had talked about that, you know, when I was a young grad student in the group. And um, so we sat down, we talked about what did I want to achieve with my postdoc? So I think that's the first priority. What is it that you want to do? And I said, I want to leverage the expertise that I have, but in a new area that's much different from what I'm doing now. And I said, I really, I'm really fascinated with biochemistry. I mean, the nanoscience stuff has been fun and I've learned how to use the instrument well, but I think I could, could use instrumentation to look at problems in biochemistry. And so he gave me a list of a whole bunch of people he thought would be good to do a postdoc with that also had a record of producing people who had been professors. And so I got, I got to tell you this, because this is, this is an important part of the story. Um, at the time, Alan had not produced any grad students who had gone on to be professors in mass spectrometry. He actually started his career doing NMR of nucleic acids. And so all of his former students that were professors were doing NMR. They were from that, that aspect of his group. So he didn't have one yet. And he goes, okay, I have a reputation, but my reputation for academics is really an NMR, not mass spec. So you want to go somewhere where you can go for someone that's got a reputation for producing academics in the field of mass spectrometry. And so he gave me a list of a whole bunch of people. And I'm going to be honest with you. So you guys are going to laugh. I only ever sent out one postdoc application. I told you I'm a dreamer. And so I dreamt big. And so I went for the top one, the one that if everything else being, you know, if I could have my dream and work in a group, and do biochemistry research, I wanted to go to Cornell and work with Fred because Fred was a member of the National Academy. 
I mean, that's the added value. But he had produced a lot of faculty members who were mass spectrometry faculty at chemistry departments and biochemistry departments. And I'm like, that's what I want. And it just turns out, you know, some of these things are luck and coincidence, but I wrote him at the right time because it turns out he got my letter and I didn't know this. He got my letter when one of his postdocs had just informed him that he was going to um, quit at the end of the, the period because the postdoc was in Ithaca, Cornell, and his wife was a medical doctor in Austin, Texas. And so they were living this, you know, long distance. They were married, but they were living long distance. And the commuting was really getting to be a pain for both of them. And so um, because she was an MD and she was pregnant, um, he decided he was going to be a stay-at-home dad for a while. And so he had just announced to Fred that he was going to uh, quit at the end of the year. So Fred had an opening and then my letter shows up. And then he finds out that my letter is, oh, his friend, Alan Marshall. And then he gets letters. He says, send, have them send me letters. So I had my references send him letters. And he's like, okay, yeah. Um, if you are interested, I could have you start in August or September. And I'm like, I'm gonna graduate in July. How about I start on Labor Day? So I started on Labor Day, 1993. So I did plan it. Um, and there was a lot of luck involved in that. But um, I think it's okay to dream big. And if there's a dream lab that you really think that you see yourself in, go to them, make your pitch. Because a lot of it is just um, opportunity that, it, that the timing can be worked out. Um, my student, Emily, knew about when she was going to graduate. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? She goes, well, I'm just really starting to get into this imaging. I, I appreciate what we did in autism and everything. I don't see myself doing that in the future, but I could see myself doing imaging. Okay, well, here's a few groups that are really good at imaging, that are doing things that are different that could help augment what you know, but you could bring value to the group because you have this experience in mass spectrometry. And timing also worked. Um, and so, uh, you know, she ended up getting a job with a friend of mine, Amanda Humman, who I told her, I told Emily this, I said, Amanda is... The, in the hot 100 analytical up and coming scientists. That would be a good lab to get in because you're gonna get recognition just because you're in her group. I said, plus it's at my alma mater so I can always come visit you and I, that'll make me happy. And it all worked out. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Wood? Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, uh, I'd like to know, like, uh, in uh, all the, uh, on the presentation, uh, you said a lot of things about your re research. And I'd like to know, like, uh, what is the feeling when, like, you are doing something like it's random and sometimes you don't know what you're doing. And when you know, you like just find something that uh, is useful, like, and now a lot of people are using, you're getting c c citations. Well, like, what is the side of this? Like, uh, all the struggle and having like a, a breakthrough on something? Because uh, all of your life, like, it's very amazing and inspiring and yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, it's the breakthroughs that keep pushing you, you know? So I, I, I people think that, that I'm exaggerating when I say this. Uh, my third year of graduate school was the least productive year of my career. I had some great stuff that came out from my first and second year. And then I sort of hit a period where I couldn't make anything work. 
bad luck in, in some of it. But the other thing though, was I had an Edisonian quality, which Edison was persistent. And if he thought that there was a rational reason that something could work or should work, then he kept at it. He kept looking at other angles to approach it from. So I sort of took that attitude. And I mean, I am team Tesla now because Tesla was brilliant and he didn't write the stuff down. It was all in his head. I'm so impressed with that. But Edison had a quality that I do admire, which was to keep pushing and trying new things and not be afraid to fail. And so I think that's one of Edison's qualities that, that I picked up was like, I'm not afraid to fail. Just do it. If it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. Then we'll try something else. But because you do get a reward in a lot of these cases somewhere along the line, that helps keep pushing you. And then if people adopt the technique or they cite your paper and you're like, yeah, I did that. But I have to admit, you know, probably the most shocking thing for my whole career is I came to become a professor to do research. That was the goal. And after I got into it, I found out that I actually had this passion for teaching and mentoring too. I didn't know it when I started, but I discovered that about myself. And now, I mean, I think that in what I do, my role of mentoring and training people and teaching might actually be more important than the actual research I do. And I'm not afraid to say that either. I mean, some people are like, oh, that's blasphemy. You shouldn't say that. Well, I'm looking to the next generation and I think it might be true. Only time's gonna answer that question, so. I don't care which way it turns out. Well, if there are no other questions, I'll give out anyone a second. I have um, a so, question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go on. You can go first. Uh, did you ever experience any um, imposter syndrome? And if so, do you have any tips for that, especially? during grad school when you're kind of still figuring your project out and that kind of thing? Uh, probably. So I'm going to tell you that I went into graduate school being pretty brash. And I, the third year of my graduate school was good because it gave me some humility, which I needed. But I will tell you, I did have imposter syndrome as we got close to the candidacy exam. I was frightened of the candidacy exam. And I, and of course, I'm just dreaming up every possible scenario. You know, I'm like, oh, I could really fail this spectacularly. And then what would I do? And maybe I am just a pretender here that there's no way I'm going to pass this exam. It's an oral exam. These people all have PhDs. So they could ask me anything. And I know that I don't know as much as I thought I did when I first came here two years ago. I now know that. Okay, it's good. It's 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 getting better for my uh, humility. But um, and then the third year, I got even more humble. <laughs> so it was helpful. But um, I started to have imposter syndrome, and I said, "Well, the one thing that I cannot do, and this was part of the Edisonian thing, is I cannot just say quit." and not try, that would be to me, for me, um, saying that I'm a loser, that I, that I just can't do it and I'm not even gonna try. So I have to go into this and try, and try my best. And if my best isn't good enough, well, then maybe I, I will have to think about what I will do next. Um, but I'm gonna put forth my best effort and let's see how it goes. And it went pretty well. It wasn't perfect. And anyone who tells you that their doctoral candidacy exam was perfect is lying. Not true. Um, 
but it did go pretty well. And that was at the point that I'm like, okay, I know I'm not an imposter now. I know I can do this. I, I can be a, a doctoral level scientist. And so now I'm just gonna push myself toward that. But for a while, yeah, I'm gonna tell you, there's some weeks coming up to the candidacy exam that I was like, and my wife was like, oh my gosh, just stay away from me until this is over because you're driving me crazy. <laughs> Sounds about right how, how it goes for many. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I had a question. Um, so what is your advice for a chemist who can't decide what to specialize in? So for example, someone might enjoy inorganic chemistry, but then how do you go about picking specifically, oh, I want to do coordination chemistry, or I want to do crystallization? Is it just from inspiration from the research your teachers do? I think that's a lot of it, especially um, especially when you're an undergraduate. I think that the people that you have as professors and mentors are pretty influential. And I, I mean, I will say the reason I became an analytical chemist is certainly because I had these just top-notch analytical chemistry faculty, all of whom were fantastic. They were all internationally renowned. And I just sort of sat in there, sitting in their classes and like, I'm so lucky. I'm here with Professors Navatni and Professor Evia and Professor Whiteman. Oh my gosh, he's sticking electrodes into the brains of rats. This is so cool. And um, that, that sort of inspired me that that would be a direction that I wanted. I had other good professors in other areas. Um, but I think just because of who I had, and the time that it was, that sort of pushed me in that direction. But I'll say this too, in, in, in today's climate, so much of what we do is interdisciplinary. So I wasn't a biochemist. I consider myself to be a bioanalytical chemist. I do biochemistry and I do analytical chemistry. So I evolved with time. And I think we all can do that. 